So I want you to, if you have a Bible, to turn to Matthew chapter 6. Being Christian. What does it mean to be a Christian? Is it important to be a Christian? Is it significant in your day-to-day life? Is it significant in your future, in your eternal future? Last week, we looked at, at trials and, and how if we allow the trials and the, the, the temptations to, to, to mold and shape us, that we kind of set ourselves up for, for a rough passage in this life and that God is very clear that when we do things and do life his way, that we get life his way. And he's very faithful in, in fulfilling his promises to his kids, that he is the creator of all things, he's the giver of all things, but he has standards that, he, that are unbendable and unchangeable. He is a, a holy, sovereign God, and nothing can change that. And with that, he says, when you become my children, when you surrender your life to Christ, when you repent of your sins and you become a believer, you are trans ported, translated out of, out of this, this realm of existence, if you will, that you are now a child of God. You're forgiven for, of your sin. That broken relationship with, with God is, is fixed because of what Christ has done. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, we get, we get to live life in a way that those who don't know Jesus, they just don't have that opportunity. And yet with that promise, with that, that realization that life can be different, we have to choose to live that life differently. That's one of the things that I think is, at least for me, is the hardest to understand, is why God would ever, ever give us free will. I don't know about you, sometimes I'm a real idiot. I, I'm, you know, I make, I make conscious poor choices. You ever done that? You know what the right thing is, and all of a sudden you're doing the wrong thing? And it's not like, oh, you went into a trance, and all of a sudden you just got stupid. No, no. We, we consciously, consciously make that decision to do what we know we shouldn't do. And God calls that sin. And if we, if we don't confess that sin and repent of that sin, then that sin becomes a barrier in our walk with Christ. But God has a solution for that. It's called death, but eventually. But he's also got a solution for this life, and it's found in Matthew chapter 6. And I, I, I've, I've taken it as part of my lot in my later life to make sure that I understand what Scripture says to the best of my knowledge. That I don't just read over things that I've read over maybe a hundred, maybe a thousand times and presume that I know what it says. You know, I went to seminary. I studied Greek and Hebrew and all that kind of stuff. But, but that's, that means nothing if I don't apply the word of God as it's intended to be applied. So I'm going to read a passage of Scripture. Most of you are going to be very, very familiar with it. And I'm going to begin in verse 24 of Matthew chapter 6. And I am reading out of the New American Standard Version of the Bible. Um, I choose this. This is my choice. I think it's one of the, the best, if not the best, interpretation. It is a word-for-word word interpretation and not a thought-for-thought thought interpretation. And I've just in my study and in my, my 62 years, this has been the one that I've landed on. I also like the English Standard Version, if you care. But he begins, and this is a new paragraph as Scripture was interpreted, and he says, No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. For this reason, I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. That they do not sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life? And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. 
But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Do not worry then, saying, what will we eat? Or what will we drink? Or what will, will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Father, thank you for your word. I pray that we would see with as much clarity as possible, Father, what you're saying in, the, in your word, in your book, in this gospel. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm not going to take a poll, but I'm, 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 I'm going to just, I am, but don't raise your hand. How many of you think that this, this passage is about, is about worry and stress and anxiety? How many of you think it's about having enough, enough food, enough, enough drink, and enough clothes, a, a shelter? How many of you think it's about a deeper walk with God? How many of you know what the kingdom of God is? See, if you know what the kingdom of God is, then you know what this passage is about. Because if we don't know what the kingdom of God is about and what it is, then we presume that it's about our self-care, about getting enough to eat, getting enough to drink. And don't mishear me. It is, but it's not. It's about life choices. It's about where you land in your relationship with God. Because, see, a lot of theologians and scholars want, want you to read this and say, this is all about salvation. This is about being kept when you are saved. And when you seek first the kingdom of God, you as a, as a follower of Christ, that you can only seek first the kingdom of God when you know you need to seek the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven, they are synonymous. They are the same. Matthew is the only one that uses the term the kingdom of heaven. You know why? Anybody know why? It's a different audience he's, he's trying to appeal to. He's being sensitive to the Hebrew people who could not and would not speak the name of God. And so he says the kingdom of heaven. But you won't find the kingdom of heaven in any other version, any other book, any other gospel, because it's always the kingdom of God. So they're the same thing. And so when we talk about seek first the kingdom of God, seek first the kingdom of heaven, then, then we're putting things into a perspective that God designed. Because our mind wants to go, well, you know, don't worry about this. Don't worry about food. Don't worry about clothes. Don't worry about shelter. And, and yet we know as human beings, we worry about those things, right? Right? Yeah, that's not, yeah. How many of you worry about these? We are going to take a poll. How many of you are concerned? I know worry is a sin, and we don't want to admit that we're sinners. So how many of you are concerned sometimes about all that? Everybody, right? Because it's part of being a human being. It's part of being left on this planet. Is that we have to provide for ourselves. And yet, we have to let God provide for us. So there's that, there's that, that, issue that that rub that we're responsible to do what God has equipped us to do and know that he's faithful of of making what we do honorable and to his glory and so Matthew is separating he says to the Gentiles in this phrase he basically says don't be like the unbeliever don't believe, don't be like those that don't believe, that, that you've got, you've got, Buck Owens used to sing a song called Tiger by the Tail. You guys know Buck Owens? He's long gone. We, we, we literally have the tiger by the tail, if you will. He, he says, the world, eternity is your oyster, but you got to do life my way. So you can't do life God's way and do it the world's way. It's just not possible. And yet, in, in a sense, it is. But when we do that, then we don't get what God wants for us. 
Because this is the reality of life if you're a Christian. You either do life God's way and God blesses you and honors you, or you don't do life God's way and God spends the rest of your life drawing you back so that you'll be in the right relationship with him so he can bless you. Because God cannot bless sin. He will not bless sin. Sin is contrary to the, to the character, the person, and personality of God. He is perfect. He is holy. He is just. So to put this in the right perspective, this is probably, probably the, in the top two of the most important scriptures in all of all the Bible. The first one is, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. So love God and love your neighbor. We talk about that all the time, right? He tells us how to do that in this verse. He says, when you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these things. And if you go back, this is part of the Sermon on the Mount. So he's talking about the, all that Jesus has talked about in the Sermon on the Mount, verses five through, ch- chapters 5 through 7. It's a big, encompassing truth that when we seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness, which go hand in hand, then we get what God wants for us. Right? Do you believe that? I absolutely believe that with all my heart. But I don't always like it. Because it's not always what I want. And you don't always like it either. As a matter of fact, the, the world looks at, 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 at those, those that believe, and they're just waiting for us to stop doing life God's way. They want the ammunition to say, you're a fraud. There is no God. And so Matthew writes and he says, but when you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, you know how to live. So what's the kingdom of God? What's the kingdom of heaven? It's not a place. It's it's living in the realm of God's authority, power, and majesty. To put it in just a a few simple words, it's living life the way God says to live it. So what does that mean? It sounds simple, but isn't Christianity really, the nuts and bolts of, of Christianity, really simple? We confess our sins. We admit that we're sinners. We believe that Jesus is the Savior, the Messiah. He's the one that that, that pays the price and paid the price for our sins so that we can have the relationship with God. And so all we have to do is, is confess and admit that we're sinners, believe that Jesus is God's son, that he is the price to, that God demands for our sins, and then we put our faith and trust in him. That's pretty simple, don't you think? Not if you think it's simple. It is It's really simple, but so is living the Christian life. But it's also really hard because we're always going to butt heads with the flesh. We're always going to butt heads with, but I want, like Burger King, I want it my way. And God says, but if you'll walk with me, if you'll seek first my kingdom and my righteousness, then your way will be, my way will become your way. But you can't have my way if all you seek is your way. See, it doesn't say seek first the kingdom of Ray or, or Tim or, or Butch or, or, or anyone else. Seek first the kingdom of Yahweh. Seek first the kingdom of God. And so in, just in a, in a very small nutshell, seek first God how he does things, how he feels, how he, how he thinks, thinks. That's why it's so important that we know Scripture because in Scripture, we find God. And when we find God in Scripture, we also find ourselves. We find how to live life. And if I could just boil this down to two things, we have to stop trying to please our selfish desires. 
man, I want stuff. I like, you guys like stuff? I like stuff. You put a computer, a, a soundboard, a mixer, mic, speakers. Man, I, I want the latest, greatest. I just, that is just, that is my jam, so to speak. And God says, hold it. Hold it. You can have that. You can love that. You can like all that. But when that becomes more important, and possessing becomes more important, then when I say what I do and what I do, I lead you to do, you're wrong. You're stepping into that sin pool. And let's just, that's simple. See, it could be relationships with people. It could be a, a relationship with, with, with your, your work, with school, with, with finances. The number one cause of marital issues, did you know what that, you know what that is? I'm sure you do. It's finances. It has been since they started doing polls. Because we have this, this innate idea that, that, that money and finances fixes everything. It can make life simpler, but it also can make life a lot harder. So that's why he begins this section, and the way the, 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 the writers and the, the, those that, that figured out the paragraphs... Verse 24 is the beginning of a new paragraph. And he begins, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. And that is just an example that, that Matthew is using, saying this is going to be a lot of people's stumbling block. You think what you have is yours. Right? Absolutely. We, and it's, we do. But as a Christian, everything you have is God's. Did you know that? I know we, we will hear or read, God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Yeah, but so much more than that. He deserves everything. And we give him what we feel like. Whether it's financially, whether it's in, in time, whether it's in witness, whether it's in, 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 in just living life for him. We give him what's comfortable. And he says, that's not enough. He says, you missed the boat. When you don't give of your time and you don't give of your talents and, and you don't give of your, of your financial resources or or it's a performance-based gift of your time, talents, or whatever, then, then, then you've missed the boat. No, you are, are no longer seeking first the kingdom of God. You are seeking your own desire and will. Right? But isn't that what we're taught? Do the best that you... It's not about being the best. We will never be the best. It's about being godly. It's about being Christian. Being a, a Christ follower. Putting first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So, so I just, I'm going to ask you a question. What did God spare for you? What did God spare for me? Ray, I'm looking in the mirror. Ray, what did God spare for you? The Son of God died for my sin. He died for your sin so, so, so that we could, we could thrive in this world and be ushered into his presence when this life is over. Praise God. But do you feel like saying praise God this morning? Do me a favor, will you? Say praise God. Okay, say it again. Can you raise your hand and go, praise God? Okay, one more time, both hands. Ooh, praise God. We're not Pentecostal, but we are Baptist. See, it's, it's about no matter what the circumstances, no matter how uncomfortable I'm made to feel, that we look towards heaven, we look to God, and we say, God, thank you that I can feel anything. Thank you that I can be angry. Thank you that I, I, I can have doubts and fears, that I can be anxious do you know people that just have no feelings, no emotion? I 
I'm so thankful that God has made me an emotional person. That I care, that I can be, I was going to say pathetic, but that kind of goes, that I can feel. But see, that's what God does. He, say, he says, Butch, and I'm going to pick on Butch for just a second. I'm not just kidding. Butch, I know your personality. I know you. I know what makes you tick. I know everything about you. And guess what, Butch? I love you. Anyway, <laughs> I, and, 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 and he'd look at Melvin, and he'd go, Melvin, the same thing goes to you, and Don, the same thing goes to you, and Tim, the same thing goes to you, Sherry, the same thing goes to you, John, all the, that he knows us better than we know ourselves. He knows what keeps us from being faithful. Diana and I, many, 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 many years over three decades ago, we're sitting out in a parking lot off of D and D, yeah, D and 30 Road, and we were getting ready to go into a church, and we were going to sing, and, and we, we, we knew that life wasn't right. We knew that there was something in us as Christians that just wasn't as it should be. And we're sitting there, and I remember us talking, and I remember us praying. And at and, and it, 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 that very moment, as we sought God, I'm here today. I wouldn't be here today if we had not sought God in that parking lot at D and 30 Road. But God was speaking to us, and he opened our, not just mine, because I'm thick-headed sometimes, most of the time. Um, and, and together, God said, guess what? This is going to be your life. Are you willing to trust me with the results? There were times in this 32, 33-year process that, that no, I wasn't. And I'm just, you know, I'm just tr trying to be transparent. We are not without fail. We're not without sin. We're not without error. But that moment in time fixed everything for that moment. And I think we went and we sang. I don't even remember, I even remember but I, he changed our world. That's what he wants to do. He, he wants to change your very existence. He wants to take that worry that he's talking about that can so easily capture us and so, so easily be, be that thing that we depend on. And he says, no, no, please, please, please depend on me. Seek first my kingdom and my righteousness. Talked a lot about kingdom. Let me talk about righteousness for a minute. It's why we do what we do is more important than what we do. The ends never justify the means if the means are wrong. God will not tolerate his people presuming they know what's right. So why we do what we do is important. I remember... Growing up, in, and this is not a, a tithe sermon, if you will, but, but I was raised in the church. My mom was a Christian. My, my father wasn't. My mom had nothing. My father had everything before this is my biological father. And my mom felt very compelled that, that she needed to, 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 to tithe, and she didn't know how she, how she could do it because my father would not allow that to happen. And so I know she, she prayed about it and she, she literally sought, sought God's face. God, why are you burdening me with this when you know I have nothing that's mine? And God worked with her and spoke to her. And 
That was all she needed. She sought God's face. I was, I'm not privy to, to what the outcome was other than my mom was a believer till the day she died. But she felt so convicted that, 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 that what God had blessed her family with, God deserved that. And it was something that she knew she had no control over. So Diana and I, early on, we, we, we made this pledge that we would be faithful to God. Not just in our time, not just in, in, our, in, in, our, in our relationships, but with everything, including our finances. And let me tell you, it, it's, it's changed everything because he wants everything. If you've got no problem tithing and giving, hallelujah, but are you giving him your time? Are you seeking first the kingdom of God in those areas of life that you think are off limits? Your screen time. Your free time. Diana and I used to work at Bullfrog Marina at Lake Powell, and it was very interesting because we, you know, I was, we're from, I'm from Alaska, and, you know, it was super nice, and it was a resort and all that, and when you come from Anchorage down to, actually, Fairbanks down to, down to Lake Powell, it's like, wow. And after the first couple of weeks, we realized that people would come to Lake Powell to escape life. And people from different religions and denominations would come, and, and they would buy cases and cases of beer, and they'd buy cartons and cartons of cigarettes. And they would, they, would, they, they, they would stop being who they were so they could be something else at Lake Powell. And it was strange. And I know I'm kind of rambling. And I'd apologize if I was sorry, but I, <laughs> I think I am. But they became someone else for a week or two weeks. And they did things that they would never do in their real life. And then that time of vacation was over and they put everything in big green garbage bags and they'd throw it in the dumpsters and they'd, they'd get their boats and they'd put their boats up, they'd get their campers and they would load them up and they would, they would head off to their real life. How often do we do that? Do we just pursue something other than God and say, God, bless me? Or even worse, say, God, why is this happening to me? There's consequences for our sin. And so God says this. No one can serve two masters. No one can serve two masters. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. So I got a challenge for us this morning. Who are you going to serve? Who's your master? Are you willing to seek his kingdom and his righteousness? I'm going to ask if you'll just quiet your heart, bow your heads. I, I want to pray for us. This took a different direction than what I was intending. But I know this. God can use every word for his honor and glory. There is nothing that he can't use to glorify himself. Father, I come before you this morning, Lord, and I simply, with all humility, Lord, say thank you. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for challenging us, God. God, thank you for convicting us and, and pointing out areas in our lives where we need to, to be fixed by you. God, I thank you for what you've done for us, how, how we have the assurance 
of, of, of eternity in, in heaven with you, but we also have the assurance, Father, that when we seek you first and, and, and we strive to live life your way, God, God, then we get what you want for us. Then when we put things in the right perspective, in the right order with you at the top and everything else beneath, and Father, we strive to live life with you as the king, then, Father, things change. Life becomes different. And so, Lord, I pray that we would have the, the faith and the strength this morning, Lord, to just dip, dip our big toe into, into you. Father, that we would be willing to, to allow you, Father, to show us how awesome you are. To show us your purpose and your plan, because I believe you've got one. Father, corporately for us and, and individually, God, that you want us to be faithful. You want us to realize those moments when we're sitting on the side of the road or we we're, we're praying, God, and, and you, you, you just compel us. Father, that we recognize that it's not gas and it's not anything other than your Holy Spirit stirring in our lives. So, Father, may we tune our hearts and our minds and our ears to you. Father, may we be Christians. And may we make choices, Father, that allow us to be more like Jesus every day. And I pray this in his name. Amen. I'm going to ask if you'll stand. We're going to sing softly and tenderly, Jesus is Calling. I don't know what you need to do this morning. I know God is faithful, and as you submit and commit to him and surrender to him, he is going to work his way in you. Thank you for being here. Don't forget, uh, we have uh, the meal Wednesday night and all the other things that are in the bulletin. Thank you for being here. May the Lord bless you, and you have an awesome week.